Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast presented by Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. We are part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Andrew Allegretta, will talk a lot of Vanderbilt football and some MLB draft. That is coming up on Sunday. Andrew is on our guest line. That is brought to you by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call. That number is 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Now on to our interview with Andrew. Andrew Allegretta joins us today. Andrew, of course, one of the two play-by-play voices for Vanderbilt Athletics. Andrew, I hope you're having a good summer. Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing great, Chris. Uh, how's your summer been? Uh, it's been good so far. Good, good to get healthy, oh, and um, good to. I'm doing this in the middle of a vacation out to Colorado, which you just got back from Maine yourself. So, hopefully, we'll be rested for the season and for fall camp and all things that are just around the corner. Really, after Vanderbilt gets through media days, goodness, it won't be long to fall camp because. Vanderbilt plays in week zero this year in Hawaii. So uh, no sooner will the Commodores be back from Atlanta than I I think they'll be on the practice field within days, although we don't know the date yet, I don't Uh, think. Yeah, we don't have a specific date as we sit here at this specific moment, uh, but you would think it's going to be that last week there of July or the first week there of August. I personally am very rested and recharged uh, and ready to go for football. I'm excited for this group, so... We'll see where it takes us, but I know the vacation did me well, so I'm ready to go. What's the vibe around the program heading into fall camp? Well, certainly there's optimism, and I I don't want to put too many words in too many people's mouths, uh, but I think there is an understanding of what is getting built. I know Coach Lee has talked about that. I know they've talked a lot about the establishment of culture and the consistency that they're bringing on a regular basis. I think as you go through these sort of processes, um, having the consistency of players, the consistency of message, getting the right people in, and having it built day after day is a big deal. Um, And my sense is that every day that goes by, there's a step forward in the right direction toward the right sort of culture that Coach Lee is trying to build here at Vanderbilt. That's going to take time, uh, but you've got to get it day after day with the right people and more of Coach Lee's people, and that's certainly happening this season. Yeah, it's been interesting to watch him. I got to go to a a workout maybe a month ago. Uh, Just the the organization, the discipline. I'm I'm getting the feeling, and look, they've got a long way to go because the talent gap between them and, and even the bottom of the league is pretty big. But you do get the sense in talking to them and watching them that the message that I think that they wanted to send, the culture they wanted to bring to the program is is starting to take a step in year two, whereas year one it might have been more of a half step. I think they know who they want to recruit, Chris. I think it's a lot like what Coach Corpin has been able to recruit, uh, recruit over the past 20 years or so. Um, Yes, Coach Corpin was able over the course of time to elevate the talent that he was bringing in, but he found the right personality type. And I've not had a ton of conversations, again, because I've been on vacation for the past two weeks, but the brief conversations that I have had is in this very difficult world of recruiting that is so uh, anchored and centered on name, image, likeness. And what can the player get before they even step on campus, which I'm empathetic toward. And I understand why they want to take advantage of their leverage while they've got it. I get it. Uh, It's kind of gross and murky waters at the moment. But Vanderbilt knows who it's recruiting, the type of kids that they want to come here and have them work a certain way. Uh, And I think I think the fact that they know that they're establishing that culture, that mindset like you said, the talent gap has to minimize itself for Vanderbilt football over the years, and it will, but they're not going to mortgage the future for right now. And I think we saw that with Coach Lee a season ago. He wasn't going to mortgage the future just to bring in a bunch of transfers 
for the sake of taking a half step forward uh, that was going to damage them in the long term. Because I've seen coaches in other sports bring in a bunch of transfers and have that hurt them over the course of three years instead of that short term sugar rush that they were going for. So I think everything about what they're establishing uh, is rooted in a very clear sense of self. And that's the first step. Um, do we wish it would flip from two and 10 to 10 and two right of way? Of course. But a sense of self is necessary to kind of brick by brick, put it all together. A lot of cliches strung together. I get it. And, and I kind of hate doing it myself, but what else are you supposed to do? I mean, we knew this was going to be a long-term build and you have to be very true to who you are to do it successfully. And I think they are. Andrew, I was speaking to someone on the staff a few weeks ago, and I almost hesitate to to bring this up because I think people will take it the wrong way. I think I know the way they meant it. I was asking them about recruiting message and all that. And look, let's be honest. They are not where some other schools are in this league and even out of the league. You're hearing about the, the seven-figure NIL deals and those sorts of things. They're not in that universe. And I was talking, and, and again, I – I want to be careful here to do justice to the conversation, but a lot of their message is, hey, this may not be for everybody. It's going to be tough when you get here. It's going to be tough academically. We've got, um, you know, a tough league to play in. I, I don't think they shy away from what the players and the program are up against in a way, which I know that, you know, maybe that turns some people off, but I think what it does is it sets the bar for expectation to where maybe you retain them more. And, and maybe some kids, uh, I, I'm, in fact, I would think that the kids that are right for them are more attracted to that message of, hey, you can have it easier at other places than you can have it here. Here you're up for a challenge all the way around. And, and maybe that resonates in a good way with a lot of players that they are recruiting. I think if you're looking for flash, if you're looking for straight dollars, uh, if you're looking for the collective to set you up before you step foot on campus, that's not who Vanderbilt is shooting for. And that's fine. Um, I think you can take the next logical step that would say long term, they're going to have to pay attention to player retention, right? And making sure that the NIL situation doesn't hurt them once the kids get on campus and once the kids establish themselves as players. You've got Barton Simmons. You've got Clark Lee. Uh, you've got a recruiting staff that knows what they're doing. They know how to find the right players for Vanderbilt. And you've got to make sure that you find the right guys that will work the right way once you get them on campus. I think they're doing that. And, and, and I know I've kind of shifted this conversation to some of the younger players, which is not to be dismissive of an upperclassman like Mike Wright or Ken Seals or the growth that those guys are going to go through. Uh, I just think back to the spring game and whether it's A.J. Swan or, oh, goodness. Um, Edwards is going to be a good running back for this Vanderbilt football team. I, I think they understand the kids that they want to bring in that are going to work the right way, think the right way, and kind of work together, which is necessary at Vanderbilt. Uh, they, they, I just going back to it, Chris, the coaching staff has a tremendous sense of self. The recruiting staff has a tremendous sense of self, and they're not going to mortgage the future on some sort of short-term sugar rush. Um, I want to go two and ten. Uh, I don't want to go two and 10 and I do want to go 10 and two as much as the next person. Uh, but Candace Lee to Clark Lee to Andrew Allegretta to everybody else understood kind of the growth that is necessary and the time it's going to take. So uh, I applaud them for the sense of self. Media day is next week in Atlanta. Vanderbilt sending tight end Ben Bresnahan, linebacker Anthony Orgy, and quarterback Mike Wright. What do you make of those three guys going down there? I think those are three guys you're going to see very prominently at the forefront of the program, not just in Atlanta, but on the field this fall, too. I think it's easy to gravitate right to Mike Wright and kind of make a sweeping assumption that Mike Wright is now the starting quarterback and Ken Fields is not. Um, I don't know that to be true. I think Mike Wright certainly is someone that is going to command a lot of attention during fall camp. Um, I think it might be reversed from a season ago. And this is just a gut, Chris. This is not at all uh, with unique insight. I think a season ago we thought, okay, it's Ken Seals unless someone comes and takes it from him, which is possible, but it didn't happen right away. And my gut would say it's going to be Mike Wright 
unless Ken Seals comes and takes it from Mike Wright during fall camp. There's something about Mike. Um, they're just so different. They're just so different between the two of them. Uh, but we saw explosion within the offense with Mike. Uh, he needs to improve, obviously, his pocket passing abilities, all that sort of stuff. He seems to be a pretty good leader. Uh, he says the right things, does the right things. Uh, but I think there's a sense of explosion that he brings to the offense um, that Vanderbilt is going to need after having a very sluggish offensive season last year. Uh, so I think that's easy to read into that, not that it's definitive, but I would go into 2022 the reverse as 2021, just instinctually, my own gut. Um, and then you've got a couple of upperclassmen that you would think need to factor in. Obviously, Anthony Orgy was a fantastic player. A season ago, as an all-SEC second-team player, according to Phil Steele, coming into the season had great games against Missouri, had 12 tackles in that game, led the team with 93 tackles a season ago. So he's got to be a factor uh, defensively for them. So they went right to players that should be impactful on the field. A season ago, with all due respect to Bradley Ashbar, um, he was an offensive lineman and a tackle uh, who was important to that offensive line, but he's not one of those you know media day type of players. So they went to something a little bit different, which I'm, I'm – Glad to see, and I think all three of those guys will be impactful. You and I stood shoulder to shoulder a lot of early mornings in March this year watching this team practice. What stood out to you is where they got better, either in, in culture or just overall things as a team or, or maybe players that caught your eye? I hate to cycle back to it again. I think the one thing that grabbed my attention the most and I just want to underscore it was the spring game and the work that Jaden McGowan did. He's fast, man. Yes. Um, he's a freshman. I would suspect he'll not be using his red shirt season. That's again, just gut, right? Things can happen. You could get hurt. All of a sudden that plan changes, but he feels like someone that immediately elevates the speed factor of this team, which you have to have, obviously, in the Southeastern Conference. Had a spring game touchdown catch from A.J. Swan. He did not get a ton of Power 5 offers coming out of high school, mostly Ivy League schools, but he runs a 4-3-5, 4-3-40. He's small. He's only about, I think, 5'9", 5'10", something like that. But he has so much speed, and I think they can do things with Jaden McGowan as a freshman offensively that they weren't really able to do with anybody a season ago. Is he going to be an all SEC performer? I don't know. I just think he brings a dynamic to the offense that grabbed my attention in spring ball. This season of the Vandy sports podcast has been made possible by my friend, Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. Just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville, but he sees regular folks like you and I as well. What people love about Jody's office is the ambiance. It's relaxing. It's friendly. Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. Whether your needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody today. Call him 615-270-2322. See him at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown or the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player and a huge Commodore booster, so go and talk Vandy sports with him while you're there. Go see Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of this podcast because without it, this season would not be possible. I get asked this question a lot. Uh, I thought the offensive line played pretty well this spring, but I don't know what to make of that because you had Davian Davis out. You had Devin Lee out a good bit of the time. I think Nate Clifton missed all the practice. And the line on the other side, that being the defensive line, was thin anyway. But did you take anything away from what you saw with the offensive line. I mean, one thing that's there is, is I think there's going to be more continuity and more experience heading into this year than there was a year ago. Candidly, Chris, not really. Um, 
I, well, I and, and, and I, I'm, I'm with you there, too. That's the answer that I have given uh, because I, I just don't – when you're playing against guys that aren't necessarily going to be your first rep guys on the defensive side of the ball, it's, it's, it's hard for me to make a judgment. But I think one thing I do look at is guys who have returned, returned and made starts before. Uh, and when you add Jacob Brammer into that, uh, of course the transfer will come in and, and probably going to play somewhere on the left side of the line – um, you know, one thing that you hear people talk about is returning starts, and at least, even if we don't know what to make of of what you saw in the spring, there is that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the continuity is good, uh, especially as you go into a season now with uh, kind of a clear, defined offense. There was that wonkiness at the start of August and September a season ago. Um, and now we've got a real clear sense of self again on the offensive side of the ball. So the continuity is good. I mean, I don't think we're talking about a bunch of first rounders with all due respect, starting on that offensive line, right? That's going to be a position of yeah. need. It is for everybody um, with the exception of a couple of teams, I guess. Um, but if nothing else, if you've got continuity, you've got returning starts. Hernandez started nine games at center last year. Uh, ben Cox started seven games at right guard a season ago. Uh, you've got Ashmore that started a ton from a season ago. So that's all good. And I, th- I think, you know, AJ, the offensive line coach, does a wonderful job with them. I mean, he's, he's as positive, energetic, and, and skilled as, as you get on, as an offensive line coach. I mean, I, continuity of coaching and continuity of players, right? Like if there's ever a position that needs that, just consistency and understanding it's it's that it's that position man i mean i I've, I've seen football teams rotate offensive line coaches every single season um and that's hard for the guys uh so you know if 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 nothing else you minimize the mistakes you minimize the bad snaps you minimize the false starts and the penalties and all that kind of stuff that's i mean vanderbilt is not a team obviously that that can shoot itself in the foot so you know uh, let's get everything right up until the snap consistent and then try to figure it out from there, I guess. Okay. Like I I said earlier, fall camp, not far around the corner. Give me one or two things on each side of the ball, whether that's a position battle or or something else that you'll be watching when they get started. Sure. Uh, Let's start with offense. Uh, It's hard to not pay attention to the quarterback spot. Again, I like Mike Wright. I'm very intrigued to see how he's developed. I don't think he's all of a sudden going to be this completely well-defined pocket passer, which is not a disrespect to Mike, right? It's just, again, be who you are. But has he done enough to be able to climb the pocket and make some very accurate throws to kind of keep the chains moving? If he can do that and he can come up with a couple of explosive plays, that's all you can ask for. I'm excited to see the fight and the competition that Ken brings to camp. Um, He certainly, I think, has all of the tools uh, to be a factor and potentially take the job from Mike Wright. And I say that, right, not to say that Mike is the starting quarterback. It's just, again, I said it, I think you go into 2022 thinking maybe Mike Wright and then maybe Ken takes it in camp. We'll see. Um, And then the running back room is going to be very intriguing to me. I think it's easy to say that there's a lot of talent there. I'm curious to see how the pecking order sort of unfolds. Uh, Ray Davis comes back. You've got Patrick Smith that showed some things as a freshman. Rocco Griffin showed some things as a sophomore a season ago. Uh, That was very compelling. And again, you've got the freshman Edwards, who they think really highly of. Um, Did not get a ton of offers, a lot of MAC offers, but they feel like they got to him before he was going to get the bigger offers as a freshman. So there's a lot of talents uh, there. Uh, Linebackers, I guess I would start there uh, just because you've got some consistency um, with Ethan Barr and Orgy. And and can they continue to be really rock steady linebackers? Can they make the right reads? Can they fill the right holes? Can they make the tackles? Um, You know, there's, there's so many moments a season ago where, where Ethan Barr was a wonderful, wonderful linebacker. Um, those guys are going to have to be big in Vandy's defense. Um, 
you know, we, we, we've got a good defensive line, but it's not a bulldozing defensive line. Like the linebacker, things are going to get funneled to the linebackers. They're going to have to make the plays. Um, again, the South Carolina game is one that I'm sure sticks with Coach Lee and others. You know, there was opportunities there to handle your zone coverage in that final drive a little bit better. Um, and it's a, it's a team unit, so nobody's uh, 100% at fault, but guys like Anthony Orji and, and others could have made better reads. Um, can those things get cleaned up? Uh, I just, if, if those two are really, really good and really, really rock steady and the, and the back end, you know, is solid and the, the, it, the units work together. Those three levels work together, but I, things are going to get funneled to the linebackers uh, in Vanderbilt's defense and they're going to play downhill and they're going to be aggressive and all that kind of stuff. They, they have to make the tackles, have to make the plays when they're presented. So I think if those two have a really good season, uh, then you could see some steadiness out of the defense too. All right, let's switch gears in and on a baseball note. We're doing this on a Thursday around lunchtime. The Major League Baseball draft starts on Sunday night. As always, there will be a heavy Vanderbilt presence in this draft. Um, I don't know that you can talk about signees so much, um, but certainly there will be several of those. Uh, you, you saw Vanderbilt already get one freshman through the draft. Um, there's talk that the Commodores may get another highly rated first round type pitcher through the draft. Of course, you've got Dominic Keegan and Spencer Jones and a year removed Kumar Rocker. Uh, what are you going to be watching when they start calling names on Sunday night? And of course, that's going to extend on into Monday and Tuesday as well. Yeah. So first things first, like you said, I can't really talk about um, people until they get to campus. Having said that, I know exactly who we're talking about. <laughs> I figured right? you did. I know the names. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as the guy that calls the games, I would love all of them to come to campus, including some guys that might not make it out of the top five. Uh, I wish they were all coming to campus. Um, so I know who they are. Uh, I, as much as anything, uh, you know, c- clearly with an eye toward the future, I'm hoping some of those guys, quite frankly, don't have their demands met. I, I think we understand what an attractive option Vanderbilt is for players, especially for some very talented guys that can be draft eligible after their sophomore season. I think that's what we saw already. Um, so first off, I hope some guys don't have their demands met. And if they want to ask for eight million bucks, do it. Uh, cause teams may not throw that their way. Uh, let's start with that. I'd love to get as many people to campus as possible. And then the one that's on the team or that was on the team that I'm hoping for the most is Spencer Jones right off the bat because he had a wonderful season and he is an athletic, obviously mean this in a good way, total freak, uh, six foot six, six foot seven, Runs with that speed, has that sort of exit velocity. I know we've talked about it on this podcast. I think my favorite, maybe my favorite home run of the season was one uh, that he got an 84-mile-an-hour changeup, and the exit velocity was 108 off his bat, which is just ridiculous. Um, I think he had the type of season and has the type of skill set that is worthy of being a first-round draft pick. Uh, I, I, goodness gracious, I, I certainly do. I know there's a lot of concerns with his strikeout rate. I was paying attention to something or other, and, and, and I guess pro scouts and baseball teams get a little squeamish when your strikeout percentage is, is drifting into the twos and high twos, so meaning 25%. And, and Spencer is he's in that ta- territory, and his length and the size of his strike zone kind of, you know, it, it, he, he becomes pitchable in terms of busting him up and in or giving him that change up that drifts down and outside. He was a bit pitchable at times, but his skill set is, and it's just so high. Um, And then, yeah, I mean, just to touch on Dom for a second, I'm happy for him too. Uh, We all know his story and everything he went through uh, with the blood clot. And and he was, it was a little touch and go there for Dom for a while in a very, very serious sense. Uh, So the fact that, that he's at this position is he going to be a first round draft pick? It certainly doesn't seem like it's trending that direction. Uh, but um, he, I, I love, I love the stories, Chris, where guys bet on themselves and he bet on himself a season ago. 
yeah, he wanted to come back, of course, be with his team one more time, make another run at it, all that kind of stuff. That's all very, very real. But he was a 19th round draft pick, and he said, I, I, I can go higher. I should go higher. I, I'm one of the most consistent offensive threats in the Southeastern Conference, uh, and he had been for two years. Um, he, he showed that he could play catcher uh, enough to grab the attention of some pro scouts. He continued to slug. I mean, he, he straight up bet on himself. He, he can go from a 19th round draft pick to a, I don't know if he's a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth rounder. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, he. I love the stories where kids bet on themselves. And, and Dom did, and he should get rewarded. So I'm very happy for Dom. I, I, hope it, I hope it happens sooner rather than later in that draft. All right, final thing. You guys are always doing stuff with your podcast, stuff always going on at Vanderbilt. Uh, it may be a little quiet this time of the year, but again, that's going to change very quickly. What do fans listening need to know uh, about that you guys are doing right now? I, yeah, it's a quiet season. I don't think we're going to have anything revolutionary at the moment. I, you know, I, I'll put this out here, too, because... You know, you guys are always doing stuff. Right? There's a lot of good Vanderbilt coverage out there. Um, there really is from you, from the Tennessean, from what we're doing internally. And um, but I'm I'm always curious. I mean, don't don't hesitate to reach out, whether it's through social media. My email address is very very um, accessible on vucommodores.com. So if if there are things people want us to do or how we can make our product better, uh, please let us know. As always, I'm empathetic toward uh, some of the. <laughs> Uh, consistent, um, I guess, messages I get. Like, we would love to be on a 100,000-watt flamethrower that stretches from Bowling Green down to Tullahoma. Um, so, you know, I wish that was the case. There's some extenuating cir- circumstances, but we're we're very proud of the radio partner that we've got, and uh, both of them, between 93.3 and 95.9. And I, I think there will be some updates to the ability to get our broadcast digitally for free and very easy uh, ways for the football season. So we're, again, I've said it before, Chris, and I think you at, at least know me enough through a year. I'm, I'm, I care about all aspects of what we do as a broadcast operation. So if there are any things that we can, um, you know, continue to work on and get better at, feel free to reach out and let me know. Uh, but I don't, I don't have anything wild uh, to update people with at the moment, but feel free to reach out and We'll, we'll continue to strive to make what we do as good as we can. Uh, I'm competitive in nature, so I want to make it the, the absolute best that Vanderbilt can be and the absolute best that the SEC has to offer from a broadcast standpoint. So feel free to reach out. Andrew, it will not be long until we get to quit recycling the same hypotheticals that people talk about for months and have actual new stuff to Chris, talk what about. You, what do you think about the football season? Oh my oh, God. Want, you, before we get, I want to know, I want to, I know, so, I want to know something. What I just gave you my, like, yeah, what's going to grab my attention storylines offensively and defensively. What's yours? Well, for, first of all, just it, not related to your question. July is the absolute worst month to, to do this as, as a sports <laughs> journalist. Uh, th- thank God we do I have the, I, the the draft now for Major League Baseball. Um, I wish I could talk about that stuff because I've been reading all of it. I've, I I do. I'm not. This is not. I'm not blowing smoke. I try to. I try to be respectful of the process and not stick my nose in it too too much because my job is to cover the guys that are on campus. Yeah. And not and not. I don't live in the recruiting world. Um, it's not by definition my job, uh, but. But it's a different world when you're talking about a bunch of Vanderbilt baseball prospects that could get drafted yeah. as high as they could get drafted. So I'm very aware. I wish, I wish we could talk about that stuff because that would give us a little bit more to talk about. But I'm aware. Trust me. I'm very aware. Uh, and, and now that I got my mini ran over, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, want, uh, I, want, I want something that I, w- I want to know what you're paying attention to for the football. Oh, well, I, I will give a shameless plug for VandySports.com. I'm going to be breaking this down by position. Um, we, we, we always do a pretty thorough job. I'm going to add a twist or two to it this year that I think people will find interesting. But I'll give you my high points. I think the back seven is very interesting this year. How that's structured. Okay. I mean, you, you've got, for instance, uh, you've got Kane Patterson, who's probably, yep. I don't know if he's the fastest linebacker they've got, but he's, he's going to be close. He's got experience in big games. He's playing the same spot with Ethan Barr, who is, in yep. case you haven't noticed, not the same type of player, body type, anything like that. Like, how does that flesh out? You've got 
a kid yeah. into Ricky yeah. Wright who's coming back to the team, who didn't yeah. play in the spring, who can really help them athletically. I think is playing that hybrid spot that, that C.J. Taylor, I'm not going to say has locked down, but they were really happy with his performance. You've got more speed, I think, on the back seven. Now, it's green in a lot of places, but not always. You've got B.J. Anderson coming back. Um, you have not been around to mm-hmm. see him play. He's played a lot of reps at Vanderbilt, started some games. Um, getting a veteran corner who's been around – you know, five years in this league and, and played some meaningful snaps. That's, I think, a storyline that's been overlooked. Uh, what do they do with Jalen Mahoney? I've heard some talk about maybe a yeah. position switch uh, to safety, but, but we'll see. I, I think that's very interesting. I think on the other side of the ball, I think it's where the offensive line slots. Does Jacob Brammer yeah. come in and win left tackle? There's been talk he could move inside to guard. Um, you know, they've got several young players who we saw a lot of in fall camp, true freshmen or second-year players, uh, a lot of whom who redshirted, who are going to be factors. I, I think the offensive line battle is going to be interesting. I think seeing if they can build depth at receiver. Um, you mentioned one freshman already in Jaden McGowan. Uh, are there others who can yeah. step up? Uh, are, are there kids who played last year, Quincy Skinner, Jamarian Carter, uh, guys like that who – didn't do much, if anything, a year ago, but they're going to have to step up. But I think there are – I don't want to use hyperbole Give here, me. but I, th- I think this is one of the more interesting camps I will, will probably cover in a while in terms of just there's different ways that things can shake out. I think there's some talent on this team. I really do. That's not you know um, me sitting in the seat I, I, I'm in. Um, give me, give me a – I'm gaining a little bit more confidence over the years – in my athletic eye. And I say this only because I picked at the start of the baseball season, Spencer Jones to have a breakout season. And he did. So now I feel emboldened. Um, give me, give me a, give me a breakout star or someone that you think could really elevate their profile this year season for the football team. Well, there's, there's a couple guys on offense. I guess breakout would be defined as a guy that's been around before. Uh, Quincy Skinner had zero catches a year ago. Uh, that number is going to be much north of zero this year. He's going to start barring injury or something unexpected. So that's an easy pick. Um, Man, defensively, that's a little bit harder. I I think that he doesn't really fit the profile of breakout, but I just like what Jalen Mahoney did so much in the spring. If he has one of those seasons where at the end of the year he's got four, five, six picks and makes – a lower level all SEC team because of that. I mean, I'm, I'm not totally shocked. I, I, I know I'm. What's going to happen is I'll be done with this, and and there'll be <laughs> one or two guys that I should have named that that I didn't. Um, you know, CJ Taylor's an interesting one just because he didn't play much a year ago and, and ended the spring as right. a starter. Uh, that's a that's a versatile position where he's a hybrid linebacker slash. Safety. I mean, th- those are the ones that first come to mind, but there's going to be a lot more than that, I suspect. Okay. Well, bring me back on. I, I've got a couple of gut instincts. I can – see, I think our definition of breakout star is a little different. Like, I, I mentioned Spencer Jones to somebody at the start of the baseball season. Like, well, he's not a breakout star. He played last year. Like, well, yeah, he did. I recognize he scored against Stanford and, and, and the Omaha and all that kind of stuff. But he wasn't a consistent player and all that kind of jazz, and then he broke out. Um, so I think there's some guys that played last year that I think – I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I could. I, I want to kind of refine my picks a little bit, but there's a couple of guys I think that played last year that were impactful last year, but I think they will make a jump this year. Uh, so we'll see. Look, I'm, I'm going to press you on that for a minute. G- give me a name or two that we haven't mentioned that you have in mind. Well, so would you consider like a Rocco Griffin if he has a big season as a breakout person? Yeah, I just don't know. I mean, breakout, he's probably going to have to get, what, at least 100 carries. They, they like Patrick Smith ahead of him. Um, Raymond Davis is, is a very good player. I mean, Maurice Edwards is kind of the wild card. I mean, I, I think Rocco has gotten better. The, the issue for me is sort of playing time, and I don't know if that – It's rich snaps. It's yeah, if, if, I, don't know, I don't know if that's going to be a greater number of snaps than it was a year ago just because they've got more guys in the system now than they had a year ago. So, or would you consider a Will Shepard as a breakout guy? Like I, uh, I, think, I think last year was a breakout. 43 catches? Yeah. 
Was that a breakout? Okay. Oh, I think well, so. Yeah, I yeah. think he can go from. Okay. I think he can go from five seventy-seven to even more than that, and all of a yeah. sudden he's not this guy that we know about at Vanderbilt. He becomes somebody that the league knows about. Yeah, that's that's. It just depends on where you set the bar, right? I mean, that's sure. maybe that's. I think we, we knew about Spencer Jones last year, and then right. all of a sudden the, the, the world knows about Spencer Jones. So I think that's where my that's where my brain goes. Well, some, I think some names if, like that. Yeah, I think if you want to combine what we're doing, it's it's the guy that has shown he may have some talent and ability who can take his game to a different level, and and Shepard would would probably fit that definition. Yeah, I think Shepard Shepard jumps out to my my brain a little bit, but that's a quarterback situation, right? Like has Mike developed enough or is Ken the guy? How are they going to use him? So on and so forth. So football, football interacts with each other a lot more than baseball does. Like Spencer just has to hit the fastball and he did. So, yeah. Well, uh, there'll be plenty of hitting coming up in a couple of weeks. You and I will both be there and I look forward to having you back on when we have actual football in front of us to talk about uh it'll be fun i know the fans will be looking forward to hearing it and um in, in the meantime thank you for joining me and and helping me try to recycle the the, the same talking points in, in a different manner how about that do you want to talk about hawaii stadium we could do that that's going to be tricky that's gonna i, I be say real. i say that's we save that i say we okay. save that for a closer to the opener podcast because yes that is going to be interesting okay. i think capacity there is is limited to say the least yeah limited i it's with all due respect to hawaii and they're going to get their stuff going like i'm not bagging on them if you got a track around your football field you're not where you need to be uh, no. at the fbs level at the moment <laughs> yeah i think i think aloha stadium was condemned so that was sort of it is maybe maybe it thrust is. upon them I in a way they the didn't see day. coming Oh, okay. Yeah, that's been condemned. I tweeted this the other day. Uh, they've, they've got a whole plan for a brand new complex around a new Aloha Stadium. When we went out there for baseball, uh, the baseball team could not use the hitting cages because the cages had been condemned down the left field line. So there was a real chance that someone could hit a line drive off the batting cages and the whole thing would just disintegrate down the left field line at Murakami Stadium. So, yeah, they... It, they're in their own. I came from New Orleans. New Orleans runs in its own little orbit. Hawaii runs in its own little orbit. Man, you can't just expect Hawaii to. They're on island time. They're, you know, they got a little different vibe over there. So I'm very empathetic to the way they want to do their stuff, and they don't have, you know, Power Five resources, and I get all that kind of stuff. So it, it's it'll give me it could be a little tricky. It could be I I may have shared this too. Uh, we can go back to it later, but the football locker room is effectively the same as the baseball locker room. Like the, literally the same room. It's the same room. Um, uh, math is fuzzy and all that kind of stuff, but there's more people on a football team than a baseball team. So that's going to create some logistical nightmares for Casey Stangle and others. <laughs> have you ever spent a large volume of time in a building that would soon be condemned? Uh... I mean, I lived in New Orleans for two years, so any one of those buildings is liable to be right. condemned down there. <laughs> I, went, I went to junior high at a place that eventually got condemned, um, and I, I think oh. was purchased to be blown up for a movie set. <laughs> oh, that sounds like fun. Did it actually happen? Uh, it, it did, and, and let me tell you, the, the experience matched the building. I, I went to high school basically with Beavis and Butthead, so or, or junior high. Uh, high school was much better, but uh, it was it was quite yeah. an experience and, and one that I do not want to relive. Yeah, understood. So my answer is no. I've not spent a lot a lot of time in buildings about to be condemned. So um, uh, again, very empathetic to the plight of University of Hawaii athletics because. The resources are difficult, and they're out there on the island and all that kind of stuff. So I, I'm not bagging on them. I get it. But uh, August 27th or whatever specific date it is, it's going to be – it'll be interesting. Well, Andrew, thanks for joining us. And uh, we, we will talk a little more about Hawaii and that trip coming up. I'm sure I'll have you on at least once or twice between now and kick off of the season. And I know I'm very much looking forward to that. Me too. I'm here for it. All right. Thanks, Andrew. We'll catch you soon. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS. We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrisley70 at gmail.com. 
We also ask that you subscribe to our website, VandySports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at VandySports.com. Follow me at ChrisLee70. And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.